Greetings, and welcome back for another Music Theory Bite. In this video, I'm going to tackle how to sing an atonal melody. If that sounds like something you'd like to learn more about, or even if it's just something you need to learn about, then stick with me, because this is the video for you. So atonal melodies, they tend to be one of the scariest things that undergraduate music students have to face, but it's something that we all have to do. And the reason why we should do them is because, well, you might not be playing a whole lot of atonal music in your life, or especially singing a whole lot of atonal music, but the very process of doing it makes our ears better. And as professional musicians, we can never have ears that are good enough. It's a way of pushing yourself to do some things that are very difficult, very challenging, but when you've done them and you become good at them, then all of a sudden, all the tonal things that you have to sight sing become a whole lot easier. I also find as a professional musician that I play a whole lot better, I sound a whole lot better if I know what something is supposed to sound like before I play it. So the ability to take a look at something, know what it sounds like, and then reproduce it on your instrument or on your voice is a very useful skill. Finally, if you're a singer, if you can handle this literature, then you're going to be in demand. People want to hire people who can sing new music, sing hard music, and if you can find yourself in a place where you can do that, then you're in pretty good shape. So let's talk about what's going to go on here. First of all, when I teach singing of atonal melodies, I do it using three steps. I'm going to do these in sort of the opposite order of what I typically use when I personally have to sing an atonal melody. That is, I'm going to teach you the one that I use the least frequently, then the one that I use sort of in the middle, and then the one that I use the most, because they actually happen sort of in the opposite order of ease. So that means my first technique, which is singing intervals, I find to be the hardest one. So I need to practice that a little bit more and become really good at that if I'm going to use it. The second technique, what I call proximal pitches, is sort of in the middle. It's a little bit easier, actually quite a bit easier than just singing intervals, but it does take some practice but it's not something that's going to be able to allow me to sing an entire melody. Likewise, just singing intervals typically doesn't make it so I can sing an entire melody. The third technique, moments of latent tonality. That is, I find tonal moments and I put them together in, in some sort of way. I find that the easiest way to do it, mostly because that's the way my brain and probably your brain also processes music. That is, we hear music as tonal sounds around an implied tonal center. So what we have to do then is use our brains, use that capacity in such a way so that we are using that as an advantage for singing atonal music. Now, when I actually go to sing an atonal melody, I'm using all three techniques. And so the melody that I'm going to use for this demonstration, when I go over it at the end, you'll see that I use all three techniques in different ways to put the whole thing together. And the most important thing to remember is this is all about just learning the basics of what pitches are there. Once you've done that, your work's not done. You still have to turn it into music. You still have to turn it into a real musical melody. But the first step is always figuring out what goes into it. So let's get started. So as I just said a minute ago, there are three techniques for figuring out how to sing an atonal melody. And the first one involves just singing intervals. This requires quite a bit of practice and requires becoming really good at singing intervals, that is, any interval, but especially the ones that show up more frequently in tonal music. Sort of the hard intervals, unfortunately. So minor seconds and major seconds will show up fairly frequently, thirds and sixths all over the place, and then tritones and sevenths. The intervals that show up less frequently, because these are the intervals that tend to reinforce a tonal center, would be perfect fourths, perfect fifths, and perfect octaves. Atonal composers will tend to minimize those intervals when they start to compose a piece of music. It's all about the resonances, having the right sounds of the right intervals in the right places. So the first thing that I would do is I would get very good at singing any of the intervals from any pitch and doing them not just in a tonal environment, as I taught in my earlier videos on intervals, but also just hearing them as absolute intervals. So you can pick any interval, any pitch, and sing any interval off of it in either direction and come up with the right answer. Now you'll notice that I'm going to refer to these intervals using their atonal terms. 
That is, I'm not going to be talking about perfect fourths, perfect fifths, major thirds, minor thirds. Those are total ways of talking about intervals. You'll see up on your screen right now how I am going to refer to them, along with the traditional way of notating them. So, for example, a major third I would think of as a plus four. That is, four semitones, four equally tempered semitones, go into what we think of as a major third. It's helpful to think that way because our traditional way of notating and talking about intervals is very tonally based, and we want to get away from that because atonal music uses a different aesthetic. So you want to get as good as you can with singing any interval from any pitch, and a good way to do that is just practice them a lot. So that allows me then to use those intervals in such a way so that I can hear them absolutely and move from one place to the next. Now, as I said before, I find this to be one of the hardest skills to do because that's not the way our brains typically process music. So when I get into in a melody, and you'll see one now in front of you, this is the melody we're going to sing at the end of this video. So what I'm seeing is I can start to label all of the intervals in there, and I have to think about major seconds or plus two, major thirds, notice that's an enharmonically spelled major third, E up to A flat or G sharp is a major third, then a minor second down, then a tritone up, then a major third down. So the beginning of this is using the types of intervals that we would typically see in an atonal melody. So if I give myself the first pitch, which is a D, I should be thinking in terms of those interval sizes. Plus two, plus four, minus one, plus six, minus four. And I think I've come up with a pretty reasonable approximation of what's there without having to play all the pitches on the piano. After I've sung it then, I can always, of course, just double check myself. And sure enough, I was able to sing those intervals fairly reasonably and accurately. Now, I find singing intervals to be a very challenging thing to do. That is, going through an entire melody and looking at it only as intervals and singing interval to interval to interval, I don't find to be a very efficient way to learn to sing a melody, an atonal melody. So I will use that as a backup technique. If my other techniques don't work, then I look for the interval and I try to figure out what that interval is and I sing it. But again, that's my backup technique. That's when everything else that I try hasn't worked. So my second technique is what I call proximal pitches. Going back to the melody, I take a look and I look for affinities, that is pitches that are close to or identical to pitches that I've seen before in the melody, and I try to remember those over longer spans of time. So for example, I have marked right now a D natural at the beginning, give myself that pitch, there's my D, and I notice that a couple of bars later, if I can hold on to that D, I can find the E flat off of it. E flat, and then of course the E flat repeats, and then if I'm really good, I might even be able to hear the E natural on the second line, and maybe even if I can retain that D from the very beginning, sing that as my last pitch at the end. There are other combinations if I can track more than just that one pitch. So for example, if I find that A flat, I'll go ahead and give myself that pitch. A flat, two bars later, A natural, repeats A natural, couple bars later, B flat. I could get the C off of that, but I also need the B flat on the second line, B flat, and then I have B natural. So notice, just like in tonal music, there's an embedded scale, rather than a tonal scale, in this case it's a chromatic scale, but I can use that as a sort of scaffolding on which I can hang the other pitches and hopefully figure out what the entire melody should sound like. I can use those as places to double check that I'm in the right place as I go along. So that's technique number two, proximal pitches. And so you might come up with some exercises that you can use to help, um, help, help practice this skill. And I have a couple in the textbook that I co-wrote with, with a colleague where they're basically just melodies that are consists of chromatic lines that are independent of each other but interspersed with each other. So you'll see one up on your screen right now. And 
if I can learn to sing this the right way, I'm practicing hearing a pitch, retaining that pitch while I'm singing another line. It's called polymelody. That is two melodies happening simultaneously. I have to hold on to one while I'm singing the other, and then hold on to that one while I'm singing the other. It's a very useful skill, especially with atonal music, as with any music, the ability to hear the underlying scales, the underlying connected pitches that hold on over an extended period of time. So the third technique, and the one that I use most frequently, in fact, the people who I know that make a living singing atonal music, this is the one that they use most frequently if they don't have absolute pitch. Of course, if you have absolute pitch, you see a note, you sing that note. It makes life a whole lot easier. But for those of us not blessed or cursed with absolute pitch, we need to come up with something different. This is based on the idea that fundamentally human beings are biologically programmed to hear music tonally. Whenever we hear a musical sound, we first search for a tonal center and understand that musical sound at scale degrees around that tonal center. It's one of the basic ways that we understand music, and if we can use that to our advantage, then we can use that also to learn atonal melodies. So here's the real challenge. Here's my melody. I've got to figure out how I'm going to work with this. So this requires quite a bit of analysis before we dive into it. So I take a look at the very beginning of this melody, which I already figured out using intervals, but really what I'm going to be doing is thinking about it in terms of, all right, so if I'm not thinking about it intervallically, how might I think about it as tonal centers shifting around? And then I can sing those scale degrees, and then of course I will go back and refine the melody. So if I take a look at the first couple of pitches, all the way up through the third measure, what I see there are a bunch of pitches that are in the key of A major. The two pitches that aren't are the A flat and the G natural. So those are the two pitches I'm going to have to accommodate in some other way. But I, if I can hear those first three measures as mostly A major, and then just treat that A flat, well, that one actually is an A major, isn't it? That's an N harmonic G sharp. So I've only got one pitch that I have to worry about that's not in the key. So if I can treat that A flat as a G sharp, and then the G natural just here as a half step below that, and then come back to my A major on my C sharp, then I think I can figure out those first couple of measures fairly easily. So there's my D again. I'm going to hear that as scale degree four. Four, three, one. There's my tonic. I'm going to need the tonic up high. One, four, five, seven, G natural, three, one. So the entire first three measures, D, E, G, G, C, A. Not bad. All right, so now I have to keep going. This next passage, A major is not going to work so well anymore. So maybe I can use something like an F major or maybe a B flat major because all three of those pitches appear in B flat. So let's see what we can do with this. I'm going to get that A natural off the previous A that I just sang. A, now I'm treating that seven, and I want to hear in my head seven, one, five, four, those are my three pitches, seven, five, four, A, F, E, and the E flat of course repeats, E. Now things get challenging again, where I have to go down to a B natural. In this case, this is probably where I would be using an interval. Three, I'm going to be treating that E natural as a D sharp. Three, two, one, E flat to B. I now have my B natural. Now, how to hear this next section? B, B, major seventh. So maybe I'm thinking B flat here still, in which case that B natural is the one pitch I don't have a, a good answer for. I just have to hear that chromatically. Or I could hear that B flat as an a sharp, in which case then I'm shifting a little bit. So I would go one, seven, two, that's a flat two, hmm. five, hear that F sharp in the key of B. So that's one way I could do that. Keep in mind that just because I'm coming up with this analysis doesn't mean that it is the definitive right analysis. You will have to come up with one that works for you. 
da -da -ba. there's my F sharp. Now notice the B flat C show up again. B flat C, E. Proximal pitch is all the way here. I'm hearing that E off the F sharp. That just preceded it two measures ago. E, E. Here's another major third. Now I just sang a B flat just a second ago. B flat, A. So I can hear that A off the B flat that preceded it. B flat, C, E, E, A. Now here, this is an augmented triad, not the easiest thing to sing, so probably what I'm going to want to do is hear this as maybe F major with a flat six on the bottom there. A, thum, bum, ba, there's my major third. A, F, D, B. I'm hearing that off the A that preceded it. G, F, A, D. And I think I came up with something that is a pretty close approximation. So now that I have the rough outline of it figured out, I want to go back and I want to see if I can now put it together into a real melody. There's my D. So notice I ended up a little bit off on that last D. I would want to figure out where that was, go back and try to fix it. So using all those techniques together, let's see what happens. D, E, A, G, C, A, A, F, E, E, B, B, C, F, B, C, E, My performance wasn't perfect. I'm sight reading after all. But I came up with something that was reasonably close and that's something I can now build on. So what I would actually do now when I was doing, if I'm doing this in a professional situation, is I'm checking myself along the way. There's my D. I ended up pretty close to there. D, E, A, G, C, A, in the right place. A, F, E, in the right place. And I do that over the course of the entire melody. The goal here is to be able to get through the melody without having to plunk out all the notes on an instrument first. I want to be able to hear it as much as I can inside my head, what we call audiation, rather than relying on an instrument to give me all the pitches. Because that's really what happens when I'm playing an atonal piece in an ensemble. I'm taking a look at it, I'm seeing the next notes coming up, and I have to have a mental vision of what they sound like and how I want them to sound if I'm going to make them sound the way that I want them to sound. That may sound a little counterintuitive, but that's the way we make music. That's the way we make music effectively. We have an idea of the sound that we want to make, and then we use our technical abilities to make it sound that way. So I hope this has been helpful. Just to recap, three techniques. Number one, intervals. Sing the intervals as purely as you can. And again, this is my technique number three, actually. It's the one that I would use least frequently as I'm working out the melody. Technique number two, proximal pitches. If I'm having trouble figuring out what the next pitch is, have I sung it before? Or have I sung something right next to it before that will help me find where that pitch is? I look for places where I can remember pitches and just move around very small distances, no more than a half step or a whole step to find that next pitch. Technique number three, the one I use most frequently, do a little quick analysis, figure out where I'm hearing basic tonal centers, and hear each of those scale degrees, hear each of those pitches as scale degrees around that tonal center. Keep in mind, I'm gonna to have to shift tonal centers pretty quickly as I go through it. The advantage of that is, that's the way my brain processes music. And if you don't have absolute pitch, there's a very good chance that's the way your brain processes music too. It's slow going, but in the span of, what, five minutes, six minutes that I've been talking on this video, I've come up with a pretty close approximation to what this melody should sound like, and now I can spend the next couple of minutes working to perfect it 
get all the little details right so that I'm ready to perform it. And that's really what this is all about. Well, that does it for this video. I hope you found it helpful. If so, please make sure you like it. Feel free to leave constructive comments below. And as always, make sure you subscribe to my channel for the latest Music Theory Bites as they become available. Until next time.